it's years beyond the worst of it. And it's your time, Mom. A time of head starts and new starts and starting and going and not stopping. Of redos and fixes. Of gazing at full moons and quarter moons and seeing what before were phantasms for reals. If this street keeps up, it will, why not? You've got the rest of your life. Hell yeah, it's a life. Minus fat mouthy no accounts. You hope, no. We hope, you and your eldest that is, this year, next year, and the years after are an age of heartbeats, steady breath, and a healing for your harms. Smart Money says you and I are in for seasons and seasons of pewter sunups and cold as sunsets and rain. In this state, who can get away from the rain? Shit, you used to think maybe it was the rain. This will be a time of cruising rainy days by your old bus stops, unsoaked, semi-warm, and daydreaming. To be true, Mom, we'll likely see days upon days of yearning. But hey, this might also be the time after a long, long trial of bootsy suitors of your white gown and bouquet. It might be, Mom, but let's keep it funky. If it ain't been in 40 plus years, there's a hell of a chance it won't. You know I would take care of it all if I could, but at present, enough said. So meantime, you're on your own for new gear. For age-sanctioned tops and blouses, jeans and dresses, khakis and slacks, work suits. Until they cut me loose, it's on you to foot new heels and flats and sandals. Yep, sandals, but closed toe, closed sandals, please, for those sacrilegious toes. Oh. Day, y'all. Turn me up on the top a little bit, dawg. I want them to know. I want them to hear this one. Loud and clear. Bright and early. Listen. I don't want hate players. I don't love the game. I'm the shot clock. Way above the game. To be point blank with you, motherfuck the game. I got all this work on me. I ain't come for play. You can show the little shorties how you bump and fake. But dog, not the death. I'm not impressed. I'm not amused. I'm not confused. I'm not the dude. I'm grown man minutes. I am not in school. Put your hand down, young, and this is not for you. On my J.O. with beats by Kanye, yo My name on the market, your name off the payroll Style fresh like I'm still a day old And it's been like that since the day old I'm on time with a role of Seiko Step on deck, your neck, do what I say so Get up or get out, get down or lay low Standing in the shadow of a fabulous man Brooklyn nigga, I am That nigga, that, nigga. that, dude. that dude Black people, Black people. let's move let's Shout move. out to my man Tyler Poilet Yes, we got topper, topper, shotta, shotta, check it out Slim nigga, to cast a big shadow Cherokee red to shoot the long arrow Got more skill, more aim, and more ammo You can get it all from a big or small barrel Like Hail Mary, full of grace Niggas come in and shoot up the place And make it pull up your face The deck, I'ma pull out the ace From the jungles of the Empire State Where it ain't no escape 247-718 And that's like every night Every day, from the place that I settle and stay To the states, I'm collecting my pay Blast off, then I'm back to the K Hold it down, so my family straight Representing the family way Pro ball, not for amateur play Been raw since the amateur stage Before the press had the cameras raised Like a long time handle away You understand it straight? Yes, no yes. doubt Excellent It's what it is, it's what it is And that's what it is, see? See? Ha! Cause it is deeper, sweeter, richer, crisper Stronger reception and sharper picture Revolve around God and involve with niggas These elements help evolve my scripture And make most deaf a classic modern figure Brooklyn, it don't matter if you holler or whisper You're coming through clear cause I'm right here with ya Ain't gotta edit your slang, I got it, I get ya Yo, brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers The lovers, the leavers, the doubters, believers The stayers, the quitters, the bitches, the niggas Rebel gorillas, the ghetto civilians Y'all can feel it from the first to the millionth, it's extra 
ordinary and plain I walked a thousand paces of light ahead of the game By the time that you get where I'm standing, I'll be gone Y'all make moves, but y'all just move wrong I move in and y'all must move on Cause I'm all too strong And I know what my feet move for Make it go without a brand new car I was fresh without a brand new song I give a fuck about what brand you are I'm concerned what type of man you are What your principles and standards are You understand me, y'all? Be good to your family, y'all no matter where your families are, cause everybody need family, y'all. Raise a hand, you understand me, y'all. Everybody need family, y'all. Be good to your family, dawg. Understand. No matter where your families are, everybody need family, dawg. Raise your hands, you understand me, Paul. That's what it is. My oh, man. Family of my family, Pencil P. My oh, man, too. Behind the walls, all of those still in the struggle. Sada Mumia, Sundiata, Magic Mel, Life is real. All the real soldiers, black people, family, y'all. Let it be bright. Hey, how's it going, folks? Welcome to the show. Uh, our guest this week is a guy named Mitchell Jackson. Uh, Mitchell's a Portland, Oregon native who la- now lives in New York City. He wrote a book called The Residue Years, uh, which is a fictional account uh, of his own life, a uh, story of his um, childhood as a basketball player and a writer and a kid growing up in Portland, Oregon in the 1990s who sold drugs in order to uh, make money and survive and uh, and be seen, as he says in our conversation, uh, and a complicated relationship he has with his mother, uh, who's also a recovering drug addict. Um, you know, it's a fascinating book um, about the war on drugs, about our system of mass incarceration, about race relations uh, in the United States and in Portland, Oregon, about a city with a history of gentrification and marginalization and racial oppression uh, that goes back all the way to the founding of the state. Uh, it's a story about uh, the construction of whiteness and blackness and what it is to be born as an individual into a society that relegates people to these categories that aren't essential, that aren't real, but that were fabricated uh, for the purposes of commerce, for the purposes of giving um one group of people, the the ostensibly the the right to claim ownership of another group of people because they looked differently than us, and so um, what a tangled web, you know. We, if you listen on the block radio, we we tackle this issue of race a lot, and I got to be honest with you, I don't feel qualified to talk about this. Uh, I'm not an expert on the subject. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure why this is something that is so. Uh, interesting uh, to me. Why? Well, let me take that back. I am sure why it's interesting to me. I was raised by a Jamaican family, and from the time I was two years old, I've been aware of difference and sameness in the pursuit of family and identity, and in a culture that uh, just keeps grasping about trying to figure out who and what it is that we are. Uh, race is, uh, is at the very center of American identity and American psychosis and American class. I just got done watching that O.J. Simpson um, miniseries that was on TV and say whatever you want about the show and about the time period and about O.J., but I was, uh, as many of you are alive and aware through that whole time, and I lived in California through that and before. I was born in California in the history of the Los Angeles Police Department with race the history of the L.A. Police Department with people of color is atrocious and complex. And you know, I believe, along with ta Coates, that it's too easy to point to a single police officer to point to the people who executed Tamir Rice in cold blood or Michael Brown or Eric Gardner uh, and say, you know, that's a bad apple, that's a bad cop, or that's a racist police department. But... I agree with Mr. Coates and others who say that we get the police departments that we want, that communities manifest the laws that they want, and then they manifest those to enforce those laws. And so the racism in our police department is a symbol 
of the and a symptom of the racism within our communities and within our hearts, and it runs deep in America. And I think I keep going back to this well because I sense, like a lot of you sense, that we got to get past this stuff if we're ever going to be a people together. And I don't mean Americans. I mean a human people. We're going to have to dig through this. But I think we got to dig through it in a Mandela-style Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I don't think us white folks get off the hook without uh, a big heap dose of listening and uh, of honesty and awareness and holding space in the presence of some stories that make us uncomfortable. And Mitchell wrote a story that makes us uncomfortable. It's a, you know, it's a story of redemption, but it's not a tidy story of redemption. Uh, the promotional materials for his book and some of the interviews I've seen uh, and things related to the book, they talk about how some people are survivors of circumstance and some people are casualties and other people are both. And I think the story that Mitchell tells uh, of, the, of the mother Grace and of the son Champ um, <clears throat> really is a story of people that are both survivors and, casual, and casualties uh, of their own choices and of their own life experiences. Uh, you know, it's a great conversation we had with Mitchell where he talks about a lot of things. And one of the things I appreciate about him the most is his uh, unwillingness to simplify things, whether he's talking about gentrification um, and racism in Portland, Oregon, or whether he's talking about selling drugs as he did when he was a younger person, or whether he's talking about uh, you know the black community's relationship with police. Uh, Mitchell avoids these easy stereotypes, avoids these easy things that make us think too cleanly one way or another. And as soon as we think we have a handle on what it is we're looking at, he throws another angle in that complicates things in this really beautiful and poetic and, uh, and frequently very tragic way. He's a singular kind of writer uh, that's getting some well-deserved praise. Uh, he just won a Whiting Award. Um, that gave him a good, uh, Lydia Yuknovich introduced him at an event today at her college and said, hey, you know, he got a $50,000 check with this award. And why this is important is because, you know, writers, uh, most writers don't make any money. And he was even talking about this in, in his speech. And he said, you know, this is a terrible grift that I'm running if I waited 16 years for a possible payout. And I agree with them, you know. And uh, and the other thing Lydia said is that when writers do get recognized and do get a couple of bucks, it gives them the ability to write more. And Mitchell is a guy that we need to hear more from. Um, <clears throat> you know, at the end of the day, the book isn't really about uh, race and it isn't really about drugs. It's about an individual uh, who, against a lot of odds, steps forward into himself and steps forward into himself in a way that... Uh, that leaves us with an honest portrayal of what it is uh, to be a young black man in the society, especially in Portland, Oregon in the 1990s. And so as much as it isn't about race, it's a lens to look at a particular way humanity um, has treated itself in this particular time, in this particular corner of the world. And it's uh, it's not a clean story. I keep saying that, but the misogyny, the, the difficulties, the tragedy, they stack on each other one after the next. And it's a frustrating read when you see people um, almost like watching a slow car crash moving closer and closer um, into their own devastation, right, into their own rage. Uh, and you see that uh, not only is everything in their own families and their own communities stacked up against it, but then these things start to build walls within their own hearts uh, so where they start to lose, t lose touch with themselves <clears throat> and the potential for the people uh, that they could be as well. Uh, so the residue years, a fascinating story. Mitchell Jackson, a, a fascinating and funny and motivated young man. We were happy to have him on the show. He came to speak uh, to our students at Mount Hood Community College as part of our uh, Mouths of Others writer series and uh, just lit the room up and blew people away. Uh, I was particularly moved by a section of our conversation when he talked about visibility and the importance of that for someone who comes from the background that he comes from. Uh, and I was also moved by a section where we had a little bit of a discussion about race and about the social construction of whiteness and blackness and how intimately linked those two things are. And you can't talk about one without talking about the other. Uh, so it was a, a fruitful and eye-opening discussion with a, with a man who's... Um, 
you know, who's experienced a lot and is here to tell us to, uh, tell us all an honest story about it, a perspective that we need to hear and that we've been able to hear, and we wish him all the best and are so happy that he was able to share some time with us. So, Mitchell Jackson, folks, we hope you enjoy the episode, and we will see you on the other side. Welcome to On the Block with Andrew Gurevich, a podcast about authentic people doing beautiful things. Enjoy the show. All right, welcome to the program, folks. This is your host, Andy Gervich. Our guest today is Mitchell Jackson, and I want to get right into it. We have limited time with you, man. I appreciate you being on the show. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate the invite. Uh, so Mitchell, a Portland native, Jackson is the author of The Residue Years, a novel set in inner northeast Portland neighborhoods in the 1990s, a place called the whitest city in America. I want to get to you yeah. on that in a minute. Uh, based on Jackson's own life, the novel tells the story of Grace, a mother battling crack addiction, and Champ, her son, who sells the drug that has ravaged his family and his neighborhood. The Residue Years, which was Multnomah County Library's Everybody Reads selection for 2015, just won the prestigious winning award. Congratulations on that, Thank man. Uh, and Jackson teaches at uh, NYU and Columbia and is also the author of a book of short stories and essays called Oversoul. You now live in Brooklyn, New York, correct? Actually, I just moved to Harlem. But just yeah, moved to New Harlem. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, Harlemite now. Paul Mooney's got a pretty funny bit about gentr. It's not funny at all. It's terrifying, but about <laughs> gentrification in Harlem, and he talks uh, about how like he lives in the whitest neighborhood in New York now. It's called Harlem. Yeah. Yes, it's brutal. Um, you've been the recipient of fellowships from TED, uh, the Lannan Foundation, the Center for Fiction, and the Breadloaf Writers Conference. Welcome to the show, man. I think I already said that, but yeah. welcome back. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I want to ask you right off. Uh, there's so much to ask you about, but how are you handling the success? Um. I uh, I'm getting used to the uh, the traveling because I'm still teaching. Mm-hmm. Like, you know when I can, don't tell anybody. Cancel the class versus yeah. when I can't. Uh, right, right. But uh, other than that, it doesn't it doesn't really affect me. I don't think. Like I'm still trying to figure out how to write this next thing. And I think mm-hmm. you know the the beauty of being a writer is you're always anonymous. Like no one knows who you are nor probably really cares but people that read books and that's like this small yeah right (laughs) so you haven't uh the 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 success i mean in one sense right i heard there's an old saying that says uh the best revenge is a life well lived right and Mm -hmm. so i I bet in some sense the success is a kind of validation for some of the things in the book and in your life that you've written about in the in the essays but in another sense uh, there's a complication there that I want to get to, but just in terms of time, right? You're teaching, yeah. writing, you're, uh, you're speaking, you're coming uh, to our campus here to mm-hmm. do a reading. So you're reading from the book, you're reading from the essays, you do uh, some entertainment journalism as well. That's mm-hmm. done really well. And so uh, where do you find time to write still? Yeah. That's, and pa- and the passion too, and the energy. Well, the passion never, I guess may, I'm even more passionate now because there's less, it feels like less time to do it. And mm-hmm. Right now, it's just kind of uh, trying to manage the distraction. So, you know, yesterday when I was flying here, um, I broke out my book that I'm reading for, for research. Well, actually, it's the Bible. Mm-hmm. I was reading page on the Bible and taking notes. I know the guy next to me thought I was, like preparing some kind of sermon or something. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but it was actually researching. Um, so, you know, I just do it when I, when I can. But this summer, uh, this will be one of the first summers where I'm not teaching. I mean, I'm working in one program for like 10 days but uh, or eight days. Other than that, I'm just writing and researching all summer. So I read I'm something excited. about you uh, in, in one uh, in an interview with you, and it talked about how you're you're really an avid reader as much as anything, and you're teaching writing and you're writing, but you're also on intake mode constantly. Yeah. And and, and do you find yourself <coughs> going back to the same folks? You know, I've heard you mention the Bible here. I've heard you yeah. talk about James Baldwin. Yeah. Um, you were reading, I think. Uh, who is it? Uh, As I Lay Dying, I think Faulkner. Yeah. And, you know, do you find yourself going to the standbys or do you, um, do you branch out and checking out new folks depending on where you're at? I'm definitely checking out new folks. Um, I, I think I do go back to the same, mm-hmm. a few of the same texts. Like I go back to Drown, Juno Diaz Drown every year, yeah. a couple times a year. I go back to Jesus' son, Dennis Johnson, mm-hmm. a couple times a year. I go back to Edward P. Jones, Lost in the City pretty often. So those are three. And most of my texts are contemporary that I go back to because I'm listening for those contemporary voices. Um, but I'm, I'm also always on the lookout for people that I think can um, 
give me some kind of instruction. And so I really take recommendations serious. Like I, I, I'm not just going to probably pick up a book, a new book and say, oh, yeah, let me just read this. I'll, if, it's, if it's not, you know, great reviews or someone I trust giving it to me, then there's very little chance that I'll pick it up because I feel like I came to reading so late. I don't have time to read the, the bad books. The bad stuff that's there. Yeah, yeah. really, you really want to focus on what's positive. Yeah. You know, or what's really going to inspire you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So can I shift gears and ask you about growing up in Portland in the 90s, sure. right? Can you talk a little bit about what that was like? You, you talk about the whitest city in America and the book really doesn't pull any punches about what it was like yeah. to be in this city at the time. And, yeah. and you've written since about how much of that stuff has not only not changed, but in many case has gotten worse yeah yeah um i uh i think it's interesting that it's it's marketing is bloomsbury and i i guess now it works because a lot of people ask me about that they're mm. they're the ones that told me that portland was the whitest city in america oh, really? I had no idea <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> yeah i had no idea because in my community northeast portland it was predominantly african-american oh, okay at that point. that's an so, interesting perception yeah so we didn't you know if you didn't leave northeast portland very much you did you never had the feeling of being a minority okay right you go to the corner store they're the people you know right right you go to the laundry match you go to the movies you go to lloyd center you're going to see people that you know so i didn't have that feeling even though that world existed outside of us yeah um but yeah some of the i had a um i went i was in california a couple of weeks ago uh merced california and the guy that brought me there was actually an old high school classmate who's now um running a program a restorative justice program in a uh, high school and um, we were talking about our high school experience together. And he's like, I was like, man, I, you know, you. he's like a, a preacher now. I'm like, mm -hmm. Yo, you, you really changed your life, man. And, you know, I'm really proud of what you're doing. And he was like, yeah. He's like, man, listen, one day I was walking home from school. And I, he had, I guess, kind of been affiliated with some gang members. Yeah. He was walking home from school. And he said some, some crips that we both knew came around the corner and just sprayed bullets at him right and he said I, he like dropped on the ground and you know he thought he was gonna die and he got up and he ran home and when he got in the house he said his mom was like yo did you hear those gunshots and he was like yeah I heard them and she's like well what was that and he was like I, I don't know so he said he didn't want to worry his mother but he also said like man I went to church that night and wow. like, that yeah. was it for me in the games and this is like the nicest guy that you'll ever meet and so That's amazing all of my peers had similar stories like that um, and so if you ask me about Portland, there there it is. There's the nicest guy in the world is walking home from school and somebody, someone comes by and sprays at him. And so this was a reality for you. You went to Jefferson High School? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't want to make it seem like it was boys in the hood. Like every yeah. day I was worried about my safety. <clears throat> sure, sure. But there was definitely that um, you knew you were never too far away from violence. Now, I want to ask you more about that. When I moved to Portland uh, in the early 90s, I lived up off uh, MLK and Morgan, just right behind where Yam Yams is. Okay. And, uh, I know the guy who used to own Yam Yams. used to go up there for Juneteenth and stuff all the time. <laughs> and uh, and I'm wondering about like the relationship with the community you grew up in in the Portland Police Department, because this has been kind of legendarily problematized and, yeah. and again, continues to this day. So a lot of that violence, I guess, was happening within the community. And the yeah. book really doesn't shy away from mm -hmm. um, uh, looking at the issues of what what lead to those cycles you know one of the yeah. things that's sort of heartbreaking uh, uh my wife celeste mentioned reading the book and mm -hmm. i'm most of the way through it uh is this idea that like you see like the 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 distinction that happens between champ and his brothers and he mm -hmm. has this interest in in uh, in intellectual things and education but mm -hmm. his brothers don't yeah and then this rift gets bigger and bigger and then the animosity starts and the anger starts and mm -hmm. then one brother ends up at alternative school and he likes yeah. that even less and so you watch this anger building mm -hmm. and and it's like and it's like you're waiting for this you know for it to explode right it's like yeah. watching a car crash in slow motion and you see the yeah. kind of inevitability of it yeah and it's and it's kind of heartbreaking and maddening at the same time so i really think you brought that into the book in a compelling mm -hmm. way man you didn't pull any punches at all thank you with thank that you. did you get pushback from the publisher um at all or editorial folks on the language of the book right in terms of the vernacular and uh, um no so-called n-word a... use and all this kind of business <laughs> where people yeah I have, out? I have a really good <laughs> relationship with my editor mm -hmm. i mean she's now probably one of my closest friends definitely one of my I don't say top advisors like I got a cachet of advisors, but I call I call her when it's time to make tough decisions. Yeah, um, and it's not just about book decisions; it's like life decisions. I'll email or call my editor, um, and so I really had her support going in, and I, I really think that this for 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 Bloomsbury residue was like a risk. It was like a high upside and very little downside because mm -hmm. they didn't really invest much in me financially. 
for them to be like, oh, we, we can sell enough books to to make this back. And, it, this back, right. and if it if it if it works well, then good. But but the other thing was it was I feel like it was different than what they had published before. So they were kind of like, well, it's an experiment in all areas. So right. let's go with this language. Let's this is this guy's. And really, the language is probably my strong, the strongest aspect of what I do. Yeah. So to to try to limit that. You, you're really you're changing me. You're not getting the author that you you want in the book. Yeah, yeah, that's what people have spoken to about the sort of spoken word or lyrical quality to yeah. it. Um, I, I asked you a question about the Portland Police Department mm-hmm. and didn't let you answer it, though. Oh. So if you want to go back to that. Okay, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I think just as African Americans, you always have like an adversarial relationship to police. But, but you know, I think, and we definitely had that, but there were also guys... Um, like gang task force police that would always be at like our high school games that would you know be congregating um, you know when we, we used to go to the car wash and just post up this is like more during my drug dealing days than when mm-hmm. I was playing basketball we all would just be there with our systems loud and the doors open and everybody you know showing off basically and the police would come by and they knew everybody was selling drugs but they didn't really harass us um, and so I, I, I though we did have that kind of you know there's like a, a base kind of yeah. antagonistic relationship. I also recognize that not everyone was out to get me. And there were plenty of police officers who gave me passes or who were kind to me or just fair to me when it, it could have gone another way. Um, I remember one time two of my friends got into a really b- big fight outside of one of my other friends' house. And one of them, like, I don't know if he hit him with a bottle or something. Like, it was a bottle of something that happened, and it would mm-hmm. burst. And then the police came, but the, the officer that came, his name is Jackson. I don't know if Jackson's retired, but he's like this little, like, five-foot-six guy. But he was mm-hmm. always, everywhere we were, Jackson was there, like, oh, here comes Jackson. Yeah. And Jackson came, and he, because he knew all of us, he was like, hey, man, what y'all doing, man? Oh, y'all out here fighting. Look, y'all going to have to calm this down. Now, anybody else would have gone to jail that night. Right, right. right? <clears throat> or for assault, which was a measure 11. I don't know if it still is. Right. That was like, you know, 60 months minimum so yeah. jackson just came over talked to us look y'all got we was all drinking mm-hmm. y'all gotta stop this be cool and left and they made up and it was cool that could have went a whole other way had it been a different police officer so yeah that's a really interesting point yeah. uh you know you do something there in answering that question that i think you do in the book really well is that you complicate things right and, yeah. <laughs> and i mean that as a compliment you know and uh there's no easy out for anyone here. There's, you know, this is a redemptive story, and mm-hmm. there's uh, uh, Roxane Gay said, uh, "Full of impossible hope." Right, mm-hmm. and I really think that's an amazing quote because, uh, you know, I want to ask you so many things about the character Grace at the end of the book, and. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of stuff, but but the book is a redemptive story, but not a clean one. I no. saw in an interview you were asked once about, oh, it's ama- so amazing, you know, how is it that you escaped out of this, you know, totally? And you said, I didn't escape yeah. it totally, right? That yeah. and, and I think, um, you know, I saw the trailer for the documentary, and it was saying that some people are both survivors and victims of their circumstances. Yeah. That's a paraphrase of it, right? Yeah. And, and this notion that... Uh, I think what a lot of people, um, there's a question in here, but mm. I'm, I'm trying to set it up. Mm. I think a lot of people, especially a lot of white people, um, want to be let off the hook when they read a book like this because they get introduced to a lot of things that make us uncomfortable to see about the mm. world we've created and participated in mm. and who the losers of that have been. Mm. Um, and then when we see a redemptive story, we go, oh, well, okay, it all turned out good for yeah. the kid, so it's all right. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, no, <laughs> I'm not going to allow that level of simplicity or that level of comfort because it didn't all turn out all right for the kid or the thousands other like the kid. And even though you have fought and struggled and have a success story, it mm. was uh, it was hard fought and could have gone a lot of different ways yeah. for you and you yeah. know what I mean so do you want to speak to that a little bit about the, the complexity of the message um, to to, pe- to white folks for, yeah. that this book presents well I think the, the, the kind of at the, the base of all of that the nexus is you got to tell the truth mm-hmm. and the truth is that I am not a clean success story yeah. I don't even know if I am a success story like <laughs> you know like you're 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 just you're a few weeks days hours away from everything turning around on yeah you. Right. Like this book is received. Well, I could write another book that's, a, you know, a brick mm-hmm. and it's gone. Right. And then so, everyone goes, oh, the guy was uh, a yeah, one hit. One I'm hit. like, really yeah, vanilla. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say it, man. Yeah, no, <laughs> well, at least no. you wrote this one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. True. 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 Yeah. 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 No shade. y'all. No right. Shade. Right. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I think that uh, people do want that kind of they want something that kind of allows them 
to be sympathetic, mm-hmm. right? And when you when you're giving someone your sympathy, you don't really have to think about that. You're it's like like they almost coerced it out of yeah. you, and I don't I don't want to give that to anyone. Yeah. Cause that's not how the world works, you know. For as good a year as I'm having, my mother is still struggling with you know getting a better job and you know dealing with her felonies on her record. Wow. So like. I'm never like the night that I won the whiting we're talking about how can we address her and her felonies so it's it's never you know it's never a celebration for me it's always something in the back going okay well, I'm not good until we all good wow so the price of that transparency you know you write this story and um and it says based on your life what mm-hmm. did you you know in in the book of short stories too did you ever worry um, about sharing this kind of stuff? Did you ever worry about what it was going to do to your family, what it was going to do to your career, your image, this kind of stuff? How, how did you navigate yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I thought, whoa, they're going to know I went to prison. Like, I'm never going to be able to have a, a professorship. Hmm. Um, I thought, you know, my family members are going to be mad at me. But ultimately, I thought, um, you know, it's my sh- story to share. And even though, like, I write about my, the relationship between my mother and I, like, that is my vantage, and and I've talked to her because she she was upset for a little while, and I didn't even know it when I wrote the book. She waited like two years later to tell me this, mm. and I said, you know what, mom, this is just my side of it. You know, if you if you want to tell the story, go ahead and do it. Like write the book, or you know, do yeah. we, we do what you need to do to tell your side of the story. I I didn't do it maliciously. I was trying to tell the truth, but I also recognize that it's subjective. Right. Um. So, but the other thing is uh, I really believe that my wound is my bow, right? So, like, hmm. the, the tough things that I've gone through have turned out to be the very things that have given me strength. Yeah. We're going to take a break for a second and then come back and ask you a few more questions. that okay. all right with yeah, you? Yeah. All right, folks, we'll be right back after these words with Mitchell Jackson. Thank you for listening to On the Block, free radio that's worth twice what you paid for it. Be right back. Uh, Okay, so this section that I'll read is a champs section. And uh, I think I should mention here that I got the nickname Champ from a guy who uh, is no longer with us. His name is Harry Villa. Harry Villa. Uh, Harry wasn't a great citizen while he was with us for some of his years, and he actually was uh, murdered in prison. But uh, he struck me as a guy who had a lot of heart and also as someone whose nickname I always admired. And uh, the person, I never got a nickname. Um, I pined for a nickname and never got one. So I said, well, you know, Champ has the best nickname. I'll just borrow that. Uh, so uh, I guess that in some way this is homage to uh, Champ Harry Villa. This chapter is um, Champ, our young narrator, who's younger in this section, uh, going out for the first night into what I imagine was an area in Northeast on um, probably church, like Ninth and Church, if you know Portland. Imagine that area on Ninth and Church where it kind of gets a little circular. Uh, So this is the area that I'm speaking of. And so the uh, epigraph of this is what happens. Peoples, peoples, have you been wondering how I got in this in earnest? How it starts is this. I'm a freshman in a polytechnic high school, and homecoming is coming soon, too soon, because mom's been out for days doing what I know she does, plus a whole bunch of other shit I don't even want to imagine, with a welfare check that won't be a welfare check when she comes home. How it starts is mom's on a mission, which means the chances of her, as promised, copying me a homecoming suit, homecoming shirt, homecoming tie, of her having the ends to give me to cop my homecoming date, a box of chocolate and a corsage, the chances of her footing one penny of my homecoming expense when she slogs in is looking about the same as the odds for us, me, my mom, and my bros, making a year in any one place without a shutoff notice, lights, phone, heat. 
So what do I do? What I do is approach my friend, who's only a year older than me, but already a young star in the curb serving cosmos. My friend agrees to front me a sack, which ain't a sack, but a few blonde shards wrapped and tied off in plastic. He offers me the dope on consignment and tells me that if I do it right, I'll double up. Both petrified and excited, I carry the dope home, carry the package in my fist, and keep my fist in my pocket the whole way, terrified it might slip through an unbeknown hole or into the abyss, or worse, into plain view. That same night, I wait till my bros fall asleep, lock the windows and both the doors, and strike out wearing a hoodie and jeans with my tiny package held so tight, this time it leaves an imprint. That same night, I head out dreaming of easy double up, of a sale, a sale, a sale. I dream of returning triumphant to school the next day to pay off my debt and cop another package. Dream of hauling the, hustling the cash I'll need for fresh new homecoming gear a flower for my pretty young thing, and enough left over to line my impecunious ass pockets with loose bills. I trek to a part of Northeast everybody with an active brain cell knows is crack central, a mizan scene chock-a-block with aspirants like me, with not-so-young dealers, with dope heads darting in and out of shadows, or grumbling up in cars with their windows drop low, only I go out that first night without clue the first of the protocol, not to mention with a heart much too meek for the comp. Serious mother competition. I'm talking a wannabe or in the midst of being D-boy on every corner. I'm talking one man shows, talking two man shows, mother triumvirates. In all accosting without a second sphere, it seemed, each and every would be buyer. Me out in the thick of it, bones a rattle, too punkish to open my mouth, and after a while, cursing myself for being out at all. Me posted on one corner and then the other with hope rocket blasting out my chest towards the stratosphere. Plus, the brand new dread that my mother, that grace, might be wandering this dim universe. What happens? I don't make a dime that first night. Don't make a nickel nor penny either. Don't make a cent that next night or the one thereafter. It takes a week of dry runs to realize I ain't built for this life. That if this is how it has to happen, my too soon homecoming will come and go without a working budget, yeah. I catch a tiny epiphany, but what about what I owe my friend? I'm new to the game, but smart enough to know the rules, the tacit laws on returns and refunds. It takes a week of ducking and dodging my friend, known for his quick temper and quicker fists in the halls, before I work up the nerve to approach him in the lunchroom to explain that I tried and tried, but I couldn't get it off, to admit I ain't cut out for the game, to say, sorry, sorry, but can he please take it back and squash my tab? My luck, sometimes it's luck, and lucky for me, he does. So I quit, that's it. Quit and don't see another one of those plaque colored pills in person to right after high school. But the week after graduation, with my corner shortcomings worn down just enough, I buy a sack with part of the scholarship I won. Buy the sack dead set on being discouraged. Buy it with the intent of softening the fact that my D1 hoop dreams are all but deceased. That for the next two years of life, it's community college in a twin bed at my mom's. But of course, I take the scholarship loot and cop a big double up sack from my quick fisted high school homie and trek one night to a brand new crucible. But this time, I make a sale. This time, I make a second sale. Translation, this time, it's on. I go from double up to a quarter ounce, from a quarter ounce to a half, from that half to the full OZ. I go from one OZ to two OZs, from two to three OZs, 
three to four and a half OZs, and some nights I feel as if I can't be stopped. It's as if I can't be stopped. In half a year, it's as if by some stroke of the blackest magic, I'm buying quarter kilos from a guy with the mint condition old school bins and a bevy of gold chains. You want to know how this happens? Are you listening? It gets better, or bigger, I should say. A year or so later, it's drought status, and my gold floss and connect has been out of pocket for so long, I'm thinking he may never be in pocket again. So I make a few calls to see if I can get a pack to last until my golden connect re-ups. This friend of a friend gives me the number to Mr., who I hit up and ask to speak about business. Mr. tells me to swing through, and I count the ass end of my re-up funds and drive to meet him. It's an early Sunday, so the streets have that empty, apocalyptic feel they do before the city stirs. Mr. store is closed, and I knock an eon before he answers. He locks a behemoth boat behind us and leads me to the back of the store, but instead of discussing what I came for, he goes on about this mentor he had as a boy growing up in South Central. He explains the mentor was a white man from London who ministered to him and his boys on British culture about places like Buckingham Palace and the Houses of Parliament, on things like bespoke tailoring in the King's English, Mr. tells me that years after he started clocking the kind of bread he needed machines to count, he spent a few weeks a year in England, every time copying a closet of Seville row suits, spread collar shirts, and silk ties fat as a forearm. He gives me the monologue, and only when he's done does he lead me downstairs. He stands at a bistro table stacked with bills, as if it's no more than a table scattered with old copper pennies, and asks what he can do for me. I show him the cash and ask if he can sell me a little something till my connect gets right. Mr. flashes the kind of teeth Hollywood types pray a, pay a grip for and tells me it's too bad about my boy being out of pocket, but that he's a man of abundance. He waves off the money I brought and digs into a duffel at his feet and takes out a duct tape package the size of a book, the first whole one I've ever seen with my eyes. He quotes me the price complete with new customer discount and tells me to bring him what I owe him off the top. He leads me upstairs, unlocks his mini bolted door, pushes it open, says, be safe, hella dispassionate. With the first brick I've ever lay eyes on, tucked in my sleeve, a trillion doubts knocking around my hard skull in a ruthless, rapid-ass heart, I totter out into the mall. How this began in earnest, there it is, people. There it is. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Excellent. Uh, thank you again for doing this. This is awesome. <laughs> Last time I was on campus, I was uh, I was playing for PCC. Oh, really? Gave y'all like twenty seven. He history. dropped it, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he I took us to school. Huh? Take me back to the gym. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get let's jump back into it, folks, because I want to ask you about that. Uh, welcome back, folks. We're talking to Mitchell Jackson, and I want to ask you about Square Bear Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> let's go back to those basketball days and uh, let's talk about that you were at Jefferson you said la- or last time you were here you were yeah. playing you were a PCC and you playing. came and dropped 27 on us that's right that's right and check oh, that check man. that that must have been like 96 we can go back and look at the box score on that <laughs> make sure I'm telling the truth <laughs> now that Jefferson team uh, was the highest scoring high school team in the state uh, for a little we, bit wasn't we it might have been yeah 92 probably I don't know my senior it's 92 we were really good we mm-hmm. had a 
uh, there's a guy in the community named Tony Hobson that started Self Enhancement Incorporated. Yeah. And uh, his son was our point guard. His name was Tony Hobson Jr. And he actually had an aneurysm while we were playing in uh, in '92 in the tournament. Oh and, wow! And he like was like, "Mom, my head hurts. My head hurt." And then they took him off the court and took him to the hospital. And they were like, "If he had to stay on the court a couple minutes more, he would have died." On the oh court. my god! Yeah. So that year we ended up taking third in the state, but it was like. A, Which ain't bad, having lost your starting point. Right, yeah. exactly, yeah. Um, but yeah, man, you know, basketball was life for everyone. You mm-hmm. know, we, 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 every day we were always together. The weekends we would all call each other and say, okay, we're going to meet at this park and we'll play all day and then we'll go out at night and hang out and get up and do it all again. Um, Why did it represent that to you, um, to everybody? I think it was it was like we didn't we didn't even have – the ability to dream outside of that. Like our visions of success were basketball players. And so that that was everyone's dream. It I, I realize now that it wasn't really my dream, but I just yeah. didn't have another dream. So didn't it was a fill in dream while I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. But I mean it, it gave a life to I mean a lot of my friends are either coaches or running clinics or, you know, some of them, couple of them made it to the NBA yeah. or made it overseas. So it did give us a life. And once you see that, you see the guys coming home and they're living. Got a couple bucks. Yeah. 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 You want it. I saw an interview uh, with the guys from Outcast once, and they were saying that mm-hmm. in Atlanta, exactly what you said, there was three ways out. Yeah. And it was uh, it was uh, playing basketball, uh, uh, being hip-hop artists, mm-hmm. uh, or selling rock. Yeah. And so guys would try those first two, but if you didn't get a record contract, if you didn't get signed to a team, guess yeah. what the third option was, right? Yeah. And so they ended up back. A lot of guys would try to do something else and then just ended up back doing that. And yeah. Uh, I saw an interview early on when Obama first got elected with uh, with that pastor he had that everyone hated, Jeremiah mm-hmm. Wright, and uh, he said something really interesting. He had a program where they would bring to uh, to that church in inner city Chicago. Mm-hmm. Uh, they would bring uh, like black stock market guys and uh, black dentists mm-hmm. and black attorneys to come talk to their youth group. And the same thing, he said, a lot of these kids had never seen yeah. a black dentist or a black attorney or a black yeah. stock you know broker. And they said, I didn't know how you could do that. I didn't yeah. know that that was possible. And uh, that leads me to a question because mm-hmm. you know you had talent in the basketball court. Mm-hmm. You, I remember you saying. Uh, in an interview somewhere that uh, when you were selling drugs, you had a 4.0 in mm-hmm. school, so you had aptitude in school. There, there yeah. seemed that, that that you had ability, and mm-hmm. it, you know, folks were saying you were a good writer since the day, mm-hmm. um, and yet still the you you made the choice to start selling drugs, right? Yeah. And 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 was it because you just couldn't envision <clears throat> other opportunities uh, for yourself? I think that um, one of the things that. Uh, especially young I, 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 I've been trying to critique this idea of blackness and whiteness so I'm going to use the term mm-hmm. just for now because sure, I sure. can't do the whole critique but um, one of the things that young black men especially want is to be visible right and so that's why basketball and football and drug, de- drilling, drug dealing looks so attractive to us mm-hmm. is because it gives us a sense of visibility yeah. in the community and at large right and so that's one thing that being a stockbroker or a dentist or a lawyer does not give you, they think, right? Not unless you're like Johnny Cochran. And right, then, then right. You're, but, but for the average lawyer, he's not really visible in the community. Right. Right. And so that's not attractive because the guys feel anonymous. There's this line in there where he says, I don't want to be anonymous everywhere yeah. but inside my head. Yeah. No, he wants to be visible. And so though I was good at basketball, just good, not great, mm-hmm. and I was a good writer, I couldn't see how that was going to make me visible. Yeah. But I could see how selling drugs could make me visible in my community for you know, the two or three, the nights that I go out. Right. Right. Like even now I walk around with a lot of stuff on that probably I shouldn't have on (laughs) because I want to be visible. And part of it, I mean, too, is uncomplicated. And you talk about it in the book, too. Mm -hmm. It's just somebody who's tired of doing without, man. It's just a frustration of just never having money for some clothes or for something that what you want to eat or for, you know what I mean? And then Mm -hmm. at some point when there's an access to that, when you live in an economy, David Simon talks about this, when the only economy open to you is a black market economy, it's yeah. uncomplicated why people choose to expose right. themselves to it because they're trying to get yeah. money, right? Just yeah. like everybody else is. <laughs> it's very right? simple then, yeah. Um, I'm really fascinated by that idea. I want to ask you a couple more questions about that mm-hmm. um, uh, in the book. I mean, do you want to go back to talking about uh, a little bit about what you were saying about your critique of blackness and whiteness? I mean, um, well, I, that's what was my TED talk. Uh-huh. And um, basically what I said, I I, I couched it in this time when I was robbed by this guy and um, he was a a 
he wasn't a friend, but he was someone that went to high school with me and mm-hmm. that I knew personally. Uh, and I said one of the reasons that he was able to do it was because he saw another black man when he pulled the gun out. I was about to say pull the trigger. He did not pull the trigger. Mm. And so and then I say that it's very easy to critique this idea of whiteness and white privilege and, you know, white supremacy. Like if you ask the common person, like, should we do away with white privilege and white supremacy and white power? They're like, of course. Yeah. Right. But then I said that whiteness is forever connected to blackness. Right. That the idea of blackness came out of whiteness and so when you say you know let's get rid of whiteness and white supremacy and white power you also must say we need to get rid of the idea of blackness Mm. because they're connected as long as we have black people we'll have white people because white people made up black people I was just asking my class the other day I'm like so when were black people born they were like I don't know I was like, well, I said, if you go to Germany, what do they call black people? I was like, I think Germans. Said, well, if you go to England, what do they call black people? They say, English. Yeah. I said, well, when you get here, what do they call you? And they're like, black. I'm like, yeah. What is that? Blackness is born in America. Yeah. Right? So we have to, we have to, I see them as a tandem that we can't get rid of one without the other. And so I don't know what the new way of thinking of it is or the new term for it. But I, I know every time I say blackness or whiteness, I'm reaffirming the idea that these things need to exist. When I see, um, when I hear you saying that and when I, you know, read Ta-Nehisi Coates' yeah, book yeah. Uh, and when I see like folks like uh, Dominique Christina and uh, and the, the poet, the slam poetry she does, especially the poem Karma, mm-hmm. or here more locally, Walida and Marisha mm-hmm. in her work, there's this there's this notion that that uh, it's far too easy to oversimplify these things, right? Mm-hmm. And and then I de- and you know the the I don't see color or we should get rid of you mm-hmm. know the, the, this kind of thing. Um, there's there's a blind there's a willful blindness there and an ignorance mm-hmm. there that 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 has to negate so much uh, experience in history. Yeah. And I think uh, to complicate that, right, and mm-hmm. to say, hang on a second, when Tennessee Coates says it's too easy to say that that's a racist cop or right. even that's a racist police department, right? Mm-hmm. Where we get the community policing that the community wants and has tolerated and has indeed asked for. And yeah. so these things are a manifestation of things woven into the very fabric of the thinking of the people. It's yeah. not just some rogue yeah. racist cop, right? right, right? Yeah. And, the, and the sooner we can start thinking of that, yeah. the sooner we can start thinking of change in these situations. And I think you're hitting on some similar kinds of concepts there. Yeah. yeah, well, one thing about Coates, and, and I was thinking very strongly about him when I wrote it, be, because um, he 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 argues for like this kind of deconstruction of white, but he also says, uh, "What is he talking? About? We must protect the black body, mm-hmm. right?" So even he is critiquing whiteness and reaffirming blackness. White, well, he's reaffirming whiteness, White, whiteness right? Because when you say black, you're always reaffirming whiteness. Fascinating. Yeah. So I I don't know where to go. Like mm-hmm. I don't have the answer. Yeah. But I do see that there needs to be a different level of uh, critique. When you talk about that invisibility, can I go back to that for a second? Sure. Because we got we saw you uh, did a wonderful job hosting the Oregon Book Awards. Yeah, last year. you saw me stand yeah, there. Yeah, and there was that one moment <laughs> when you stood out and you were like, I just got to say, I look good. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I looked over at my wife and she was like, you look good. And I was like, damn, we got a problem. <laughs> but that, that confidence, that, that level of self-confidence and uh-huh. that ability to, to really stand in that moment, mm-hmm. I think people can maybe misunderstand that, right? Because, yeah. uh, you know, I've, I've I've read and talked to folks that have looked at this in like even in like hip hop culture that yeah. kind of that kind of bragging motif right mm-hmm. where when one maybe looks at that from the wrong lens it could be like yeah. oh who's this guy you know mm-hmm. think he is or whatever right but mm-hmm. when you're talking about about people who for one reason or another structurally have had something reinforced that takes away their dignity yeah that the stepping into that is a kind of beautiful and yeah. empowering thing I mean you know what yeah. I mean yeah I mean I, I think uh, one of the things that like hip hop understands it because it's born out of that, yeah. right? Like it, it born out of braggadocio. Yeah. But but literature does not understand that yeah. at all. <laughs> at right? all. Because yeah. really, at its ground level, literature is about wealth, mm-hmm. right? Like the people who are creating it, the people who make it, all of those people yeah. are from means. They're from wealth, and so they are always trying to downplay their wealth. They don't yeah. want you to know about it. It's true. But I don't come from that. Mm-hmm. So the minute I get something, I'm going to let you know that I got it. I'm yeah. here. Yeah. Right? right. And so, yes, you can look at it as like maybe he should temper that. But the other part of that is, again, I want to be visible. And not, I'm really not doing it for them. I'm doing it for the person that comes behind me, the young guy that says, I can't be visible being a writer. Well, yes, you can. 
right? You know, do it the right way, though. Like, really study the... Because the other thing is, like, when I stand out there and I do that, I recognize that residue is behind me. Yeah. And if you don't like me, you would have a hard time dismissing my work. Yeah. Right? So it's not just a guy just out there grandstanding with nothing to back it up. So I, I, I'm also aware of that. Like, when I do it, like, I, I did this thing over here already. So now every time that someone stamps it, the whiting stamp or whatever it is, I know that that is just more ethos for me when I'm out in the world. It's a powerful answer. All right, we got a few minutes left to ask you a couple more questions. You okay. can hang around for a minute? Yep. All right, folks, we're going to take our last break, and we'll be right back with Mitchell Jackson. I wish I was in school. I wish I was in school. Summer isn't fun when you're hungry. If only I had a big test today. Or a book report to give. Give me a math quiz. Give me some homework. If your child relies on free school lunches, we can help provide them with free meals this summer. I'll stay after class. I'll clean the chalkboard. I'll keep my desk real clean. So they can stop worrying about food and start focusing on fun. I'll do extra homework. I'll clean the class pet's cage. I'll skip recess. School might end, but free lunches don't have to. I wish I was in school. I wish I was in school. If your child relies on free school lunches, we can help provide them with free meals this summer. Visit feedingamerica.org slash summer meals to find your local food bank for help. Once again, that's feedingamerica.org slash summer meals. Together, we're Feeding America. A message from Feeding America and the Ad Council. This is Walida Emerisha, uh, co-editor of Octavia's Brood, and I would like to say in the traditional greeting of Klingonese, Kaplach! Welcome. If the music makes you move, cause you can dig the groove. So I realized in the intro, Mitchell, that I called it the uh, the Whiting Award, and it's prestigious. I'm a professor of literature, and I think I think I have a blockage in my head of calling yeah, it the cool. Whiting Award. There's I a had sick ir- call it too. Yeah. There's a sick <laughs> irony in giving you something called the Whiting Award, all right? You know what I mean? Like I feel like that's yeah. there's a problem there. A <laughs> um, couple more questions about the book, uh, if mm-hmm. you don't mind. The uh, you know Champ, we're introduced to a character. Um, that is is a complicated character, right? Mm-hmm. And and Champ uh, has has a, and and I've actually heard you talk about this in, in the book of essays as well. Mm. Um, Champ has a particular view of women, right? Yeah, that, I'm reading about that today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm wondering, you know, I don't want to ask you anything as pedantic as like, you know, how much is Champ like Mitchell, right? Yeah. But I just, you know, have you uh, have you gotten some pushback from readers? Have uh, you had people <laughs> misunderstand this or or speak to it in ways that bring a lot of anger out of folks, right? Because Champ, um, not only towards the girl the, who's going to be the mother of his child, but yeah. all of the other women that he's cheating on her with. And I always felt like it was a kind of displaced anger at his mother that he yeah. can't safely display directly to her. And yeah. so it's got to come on on every other female that he well, meets. I think that's a really accurate um, way to kind of view this. Mm. Um, I, I, I'll say that uh, the Mitchell, not Champ, uh, there's there's the the guy that I love, the guy that that raised me. He was really a pimp, mm. right? And so I, and he used to take me around with him to you know go do this and do that, and he wow. would, he would give me advice. Um, about how to treat women or not treat them, mm-hmm. and uh, I ne- I never really got I don't I'll never get over that. Mm-hmm. Right, that's I mean that's at my nexus, wow. and so that shaped 
a lot of how I view women. And then, you know, you go 20 years of watching your mother struggle with addiction and lose Mm -hmm. her dignity and do all of these things that harm you. That also helps shape how I view women. So I've spent my adulthood trying to deconstruct that and get as far away from that as I can. Mm. Not always as successful as I would like to be, but that's I, I realized that that's at my core and when it was happening I didn't even realize it was indoctrination I was just like I love this guy and I love hanging out with him and I don't even think that he did because he was doing the stuff from when he was like 13 and 12 yeah. and so it's just you know the cliche blind leading blind that's really he was creating another him but he thought another him he thought I was going to be better than him but better in the areas that he valued yeah um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of that. And I, my, um, my editor, whom I love, um, one of the major critiques that she had was she was like, yo, you really have to watch how you're characterizing women. Mm. And so I actually went back and did some work on this. So what you're seeing now is after It's dialed back editing. a little bit now. <laughs> and uh, one of the things, but I said, I can't take it all out because then I'm not being honest. So Did you fear that people wouldn't re- wouldn't like the character, yeah, um, or or would would be so traumatized by stuff like that that they would have a hard time resonating with them? Or did you I, not even worry about that? You just said I'm gonna tell the truth. Not to worry about it because mm. the other thing is I know these guys exist. Yeah, I live with them. I've talked to them. Mm-hmm. I know how they think. And if you are dismissing them, you're d- dismissing a large part of the population of men that I know. Um, and, but the other uh, but I, yeah there's blowback like I, someone was just a writer friend of mine was telling me she was like you know such and such writer don't like you and I'm like I, I never met her she's like yeah she just doesn't like them she thinks you're misogynist I'm like but she don't even know me she don't even know yeah, yeah like you read some fiction and now yeah. I'm a misogynist yeah the mistake is made that, that you are champ <laughs> yeah, in an uncritical complain. unreflective way yeah, yeah yeah and I think that's that's a bit dismissive of the process and of what writing is you yeah. know um, that's really fascinating I what I want to ask you about uh, in our final minutes, uh, and I might come back to that misogyny thing if we have the time, but I don't mm-hmm. want to run out of time to ask you about grace. Because at the the book ends, um, I don't want to give it away for people, right? They just need to go get it and read it if they haven't yet. Yeah. Um, and I want to c- conclude with asking you a little bit about what's next, because mm-hmm. as great as this is and all the, the great press you're getting for this mm-hmm. and how it, it's moving for people, this was from a couple of years ago, so I know yeah. you don't just want to be known as a guy that did this thing in 2013. No. Right? You got a lot else going on as well. Yeah. Um, but with the character Grace, you know, at the end, we don't have a nice, tidy ending. Things kind of fall apart for both characters again. And then she's, you know, in a position where she's, and again, I'm trying to be vague so mm-hmm. re- people can just go read the book, where she's um, in that spot like you were talking about. She's both a survivor and a victim of yeah. her own circumstances. And she starts kind of coming back to the scripture and some and some of these kind of hopeful views. Mm-hmm. And there's, a, there's that element of hope in it, but it also is kind of tragic because it also seems kind of delusional given her circumstances. Yeah. and everything that's happened and I yeah. was wondering uh, did you want to leave people with that kind of uneasy feeling of the cycle maybe uh, starting itself all over again yeah. maybe this person's on the way out does anyone ever really get out can we yeah. ever really outlive the things that, that that have made us who we are yeah well that's it you yeah. said it like it, there is there's I mean I live with that every day mm-hmm. like people always ask me so how's your mom doing is she you know have she, is she clean I'm like as far as I know but you know th- th- there's tomorrow right, and I, right. I hope that there's you know that she's clean tomorrow but I don't know you know people ask me like you know, well, how are you doing I mean well yeah things are going good now but I don't know what I would do if I was dead broke mm-hmm. you know like who knows right and so I wanted that to be a part of the book because that is the real world like you you never get out of it and even if I feel like I have um, achieved a, uh, a status that keeps me from going back there. My friends haven't, you know. Like I got a friend that's coming home after 17 years and probably two or three months, and I'm like, what can I do from him so that he doesn't go back? Like I'm like, okay, do I get him clothes? Do I buy him a cell uh-huh. phone? What is it that I'm going to do to help? Because this is a guy that was there for me. Like, this ain't somebody that I just, we saw in passing. This is someone who, like, genuinely cared about me. So there's a responsibility that that I see to do something that's going to help put him in a position where he doesn't go back. That's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, what was that like for you in our final minutes here uh, to go back to McLaren and actually go read from the book and speak oh, to Oh, yeah, no, guys? Sandy M. I did go back Sandy to McLaren. M, Sandy M, yeah, yeah okay, so, sorry. Man, that was like... I mean, there's been some experiences in it since then, but there, I mean, that was like surreal. That's the best way to describe it. Like, that was the first time I had ever gone back to a prison 
since I was released. Wow. And to walk through the yard, oh, man. The video of you up at that podium kind of gathering yourself before you, I mean, it gives me chills just yeah, thinking about man. it, man. You can really see, like, everything about you in your previous life coming yeah. coming through your head at that moment for yeah. the, that brought you to that place at that time. Yeah. The guys received it really, really well. Huh? Yeah, man. It was like, That's powerful. It was like being in there with family almost. It was wow. guys in there that I like went to high school with and we used to play against each other. And uh-huh. then there was a guy that came. He was like, yo, I was, my uncle's been down for since 84. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yo, I was your uncle Selly, man. He, I know your uncle. I'm like, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. You think you're the guy that inspired Damon to write that reflective essay about himself? And uh, I don't know. You know what? I, I <laughs> that know was really Stud, good. Stud has been, you know, yeah. he, he, keep, he called me sometime or he'll text mm-hmm. me, and I know that he's paying attention to the writing, so yeah. maybe. I, I text him the day I read that. I'm like, yo, man, I was, even if you dictated that, that was pretty good. That's something good, We got to yeah. fix that POV in there, but other than that, <laughs> uh, give him critiques. Yeah. I love it. Man. That's for real. Yeah. Well, Mitchell, what's next, man? What's on the horizon? Uh, uh, narrative nonfiction called Survival Math. Um, it explores some of the same stuff in Residue, but it's it expands on it. It's um, talking about the history of America, Reconstruction, the history of Portland, Oregon, um, blood donations, um, Van Port, and there? all that time through yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I, I, what I what I the the thing that bothered me the most about Residue is that people kept talking about it as art, but not as something that was intellectual property mm-hmm. and um and so mm. I, I figured well i know how to make you pay attention to my mind i'm just going to write some non-fiction, non-fiction. there you go fascinating yeah. man so there's yeah. not a chance you want to tackle that hill as well huh? yeah yeah so that's the next thing and that's still part of this need to be seen and i mean that in yeah. a positive sense right yeah, like yeah. you bring something to the table and yeah. you want to make sure people take notice well my need to be seen is now about a legacy and I don't mean like a hundred years from now. I mm-hmm. mean like the guy that I go see in such and such group home or mm-hmm. that's 17 years old that really wants to be visible but doesn't know. He only has these three or four different avenues. Like I want him to look at me and go, man, that's possible. As a conduit. Yeah. That's possible for them too. Yeah. So your work in the prisons and your work with students is yeah. really a way to do that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Awesome. Mitchell, thanks for speaking with us, man. I really yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for the it. opportunity, man. Our I guest has been, it. I stepped right on your thank that's you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest has been Mitchell Jackson, folks. We really appreciate you being with us. If you haven't read the residue years yet, go check it out on your website, MitchellSJackson.com. Uh, lastly, real quick, status of the documentary, is that still going to happen? Man, it's Lit Hub, uh, probably next week or maybe the week after, it's going to show in three parts so it'll just be available not, oh. not selling or anything I'm just we're, we're posting it I'm, I'm working right now uh, BuzzFeed is a partner um, well hopefully they're a partner and Vibe Magazine so um, we're blasting it out the man. trailer's on your site and it's beautiful so yeah. I can't wait for folks to see it yeah thank you thanks for being here Mitchell alright we'll see you folks on the other side You've been listening to On the Block with Andrew Gurevich. The show is produced in Portland, Oregon by Michael DiNapoli at MD Productions. Theme music by Cat Power. Closing music by Jonathan Oak. Look us up on the web at ontheblockradio.com, where you can also link to us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Don't forget to tune in next week for a brand new episode. Previous episodes can be found on our website. Thanks for listening. Oh, you beautiful kitty kitties. Oh, look at you out there. Creators of art, history, thought. New minds looking at this world and our lives. Beautiful, beautiful. Like a bolt of lightning in your head. Trying to tell you to remember that the world is a paper thin veil over the truth. We've got our fingers in the seams, we've got our ears against the wall, listening, waiting for the voice of creation to speak our names, to call us back from the brink. It's 11. <laughs>